Last week, we were out on the streets of Long Beach with uh, Team World Vision. And uh, our, uh, just to update on that, our 10 runners last week uh, at the Journey raised um, over $29,000 uh, for clean water projects. Um, uh, so kudos to all of them, and thanks to all of you who supported them that uh, in what has become an integral part of the mission of, of the Journey family. So really excited about that. I want to remind you, I, I forget to do this, uh, that the, on our Church Center app, every week I prepare a, an outline that has notes that go along with it. When you see the slides that show up on the screen, uh, you'll see words that are underlined. There's kind of a fill-in-the-blank thing. It's just to help you follow along with the message, to, to stay connected, and uh, also this can be a resource that you use throughout the week to, to remember uh, those things that you listen to, and you're like, wow, I need to remember that. And then by like, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon, it's like, what was it that I was going to remember? Just to help you with that and kind of lean into it and pray uh, through the week with that. So you can download the notes online uh, from the Church Center app. Um, my daughter, Kaylee, uh, many of you know her, taught at Mayfair High School, middle school, for like six and a half years, I think. And uh, I know a bit about teachers, um, mostly because I like went to school for over 20 years, and so I encountered a lot of teachers uh, over uh, that period of time. Uh, I'm married to a teacher. I have three kids who are teachers. Um, I actually did some teaching for a while and, um, and substitute teaching. So I've had kind of a, a broad experience with, with teachers in a lot of different realms. And, and um, my daughter Kaylee, I, she's a bit of an anomaly when it comes to teachers. Um, first of all, just in the fact that um, she loved being a teacher, uh, you know, and, and like her favorite part of teaching wasn't June, July, and August, uh, which I think, I mean, it doesn't make her like, like extinct, right? But I, I kind of put it in more of the category of, of like a blue-footed booby. Uh, rarely seen, but, but they do exist, and you might every once in a while come across one. She, she loved being a teacher. She taught middle school, and she loved it. Now, that's a different breed, right? That's, finding a teacher who loves teaching is one thing. Finding a middle school teacher who loves teaching middle schoolers is kind of a whole different thing. I kind of put that in the category of maybe a Sasquatch, like you hear about them, Every once in a while you get a grainy photo, but maybe, yeah, there might be one out there somewhere, someday that we might find one, right? The Sasquatch. And not only did she teach middle school and love it, she taught middle school math using common core curriculum, that much maligned uh, educational initiative that came out of, I think it was like 2010, um, that identified common standards that every student was supposed to master by the end of each school year, but somehow uh, succeeded in eluding the understanding of every parent of every student that existed. She taught middle school math using common core curriculum, and she loved it. To me, that pretty much makes her a unicorn. Right? Does that really even exist? During Jesus' life and um, his ministry, he was addressed by people a lot of different ways. I, most commonly, we would probably think, well, what did, um, how do people address Jesus? They would address him as Jesus. Actually, in everyday conversation, very few people did address Jesus as Jesus. You find his name over and over and over again in the uh, accounts of Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, because they always are saying, Jesus said, or Jesus did, or then Jesus went to, or then Jesus, they, they use his name to describe his activity, but not necessarily in how they address him. The, about the only people you'll find dressing Jesus as Jesus are not really people, they're demons. The demons always called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, he was also um, often referred to as um, Christ or the Messiah. Uh, Christ was a Greek title. Messiah was a Hebrew title for the anointed one, the long-anticipated, expected arrival of the one who would come and, and rescue Israel from um, their uh, oppression under the Roman government. 
uh, that was talked about throughout the prophets. They talked about Jesus being the Christ or the Messiah. Um, often, uh, Lord or Master, these were some of Jesus' favorite names. When he told stories or parables about his ministry and who he was and what he was doing, he would often use Lord or Master in those stories that were really about him. That's the way he referred to himself. Sometimes referred to um, by his origins, son of, um, son of God, having um, come from the Father, son of man, born of the Virgin Mary. Also using figurative or descriptive language, um, illustrations or metaphors like Jesus was the light of the world, or Jesus was the way and the truth and the life, or Jesus was the resurrection and life, or Jesus was the bread of life. There are all these different ways that people um, talked about and referred to, and Jesus talked about himself. But one of the most common ways that people addressed him in their everyday activity, in their everyday encounters with him, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those stories, those biographies of Jesus' life, one of the most common ways people addressed Jesus was teacher. Teacher. His disciples almost always or frequently address him as teacher, most commonly as teacher. And you see, like, I'm just going to, a couple examples, or one example in each category, but uh, his disciples uh, in that moment when they were on the boat and there was a storm, and, and the storm is raging and Jesus is sleeping on the boat and, they, and they're afraid for their lives and they think they're going to die and they go and wake Jesus up. So what are they, what's their impulse response in, the, in this moment of panic? Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They call him teacher. His inquirers, people who, who approached Jesus on the street and through the path of life, who would come up to him, who had heard about him and wanted to be healed by him or wanted to learn from him, would come up to him and say, Teacher, what good thing, one guy says, must I do to inherit eternal life? His followers called him teachers. His inquirers called him teachers. Even his critics often called him teacher. An expert in the law, Matthew says, tested Jesus with his question. How did he address his question? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? His followers, his inquirers, his critics, and it's a, it's a name, it's a label that Jesus embraced for himself. You call me, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, you call me this, and you do so for the right reason, so for, because that is what I am. I am your teacher. Jesus was a teacher. And when you look at the core of Jesus' teaching. It was decidedly, overwhelmingly uncommon. It was uncommon in what Jesus taught, that, that over and over again in the lessons that he taught, he was always rocking the boat, teaching things differently than what people understood them or how they'd been taught in the past. Just for uh, example, in the Sermon on, on the Mount, one of his most famous teachings, five times Jesus says, you have heard that it was said. That, that's the way everybody else is telling you, but I tell you, my core is different. You have heard that it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, once you've already given yourself over to anger, You've already committed murder in your heart. Do not. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what the old, that's what they say. But I say to you, do not swear or um, turn the other cheek. Right? You have heard, but I say to you. He challenged the teachings of the teachers of the law. He, he challenged the way that they were doing their faith and the religion. The same, he was Jewish, they were Jewish, but, but he taught a different way of understanding and a different way of practicing these core tenets of the Jewish faith. For example, the Sabbath. 
right? He, he challenged what you could do and what you couldn't do and what the motives and, and, and the, the reasons and the intentions of the Sabbath were. He said, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It's for our benefit, not for its benefit. In the company that he kept, he was always crossing the line. He was talking to the people that good Jewish people didn't talk to. He was interacting with people, the, the tax collectors and the sinners. He touched the leper. He, he came into contact with, with dead people. All of these are violations of the law. He was always rocking the boat. He defied conventional wisdom. If you want to be great, everybody knows if you want to be great, what you need to do is you need to get people under your thumb. You need to rule over them. You need to be in control. That's what the world says. Jesus says, not me. If you want to be great in my kingdom, he says, what you need to become is a servant of everyone. To master the ways of the kingdom, he says, you don't need to rise to power. He says, you need to become like a little child. This is the way the world does things. My wisdom is different, right? In the world, if you have somebody over for dinner, who do you invite? You invite your friends, the people you like and the people who like you. He says, no, don't invite those people. Invite the people who can't pay you back. If you go to a banquet and the banquet hall is, is full of seats, he says, most people want to go up and take the seat of honor. I'm telling you to take the seat at the back of the room unconventional wisdom, unconventional teasing. The things that he taught were always rocking the boat, always upsetting the people, always turning the world upside down. What he taught rocked the boat. How he taught muddied the waters. Right? He, he was a storyteller. Now, storytelling is a, is a great tool for teachers, right? I mean, a lot of great teachers are great storytellers. It's a, it's a very effective way of communicating with other people. Matthew, one of uh, Jesus' followers, says, Jesus spoke all of these things over and over again to the crowd in parables, stories. He did not say anything for them without using a parable. But when Jesus told these stories... Oftentimes, they left people more confused than clarity, clarified, right? They, they were cryptic. They were they're stories that people listened to, and they were awed by, and they were interested in, but they didn't quite understand. They couldn't get their brain about, around what he was saying. I, I've spent a lot of my time in, in the course of my life, what do I do? I, you know, I prepare and preach sermons. And I, I sit up here every, every week, and what do I try to do? I try to explain to you what Jesus said and what he meant when he said it. Why is that such hard work? Because <laughs> he was always confusing people. And, and part of it is language. You know, it's, we're, we're moving from um, Greek and Aramaic to English, and you always, things are always lost in translation, so you have to figure the, you know, what's lost in translation. Part of it's because of, of culture and history, and we live in a different world, so we don't understand things and experience things the same way, and so we're trying to bridge those gaps. But, but Jesus' listeners were often confused. I mean, like, we're confused, and we think, well, maybe those are the reasons we're confused. But they were confused, and they knew all that stuff. They knew the language. They knew the culture. They knew the context that he was speaking from. And, and yet, Jesus was perfectly content to, to leave them scratching their heads. Right? He's a great storyteller, but his stories didn't always make sense to the people that he was telling them to. He was also very fond of using show and tell. Right? He would just walk into the field and say, hey, you know what? The kingdom of God is like this. He, t he talked about vines and branches and sheep and, and shepherds and seeds and light and bread and buildings and armies. All these different metaphors and images that he used to, to teach people and to explain the ways of his kingdom and his message. And, and those two were also often hard for people to understand. They didn't get it. And, and to make matters worse, when they did get it, when they did understand what he was saying, 
they often found it hard to believe, like really, that, that's what you're saying? That's what you mean? That's what you're talking about? Hard to believe and even harder to do. You know, he taught one time on marriage. And, and when he was done teaching, his disciples said, wow, if that's the way it is, wouldn't it be better if nobody got married? He taught on money. And his disciples' response to his teaching on money was, if that's the way it is in the kingdom, if that's the way we're supposed to engage with and interact, then, then who can be saved? Right? They understood what he was saying in these contexts, but they couldn't believe what he was saying, and they couldn't understand how it was even possible to do it. He was, as all many great teachers are, right? questions are, are an integral part, integral part of teaching. Teachers ask students questions. Students ask teachers um, questions for, for clarification, for understanding. Jesus used a lot of questions and answers. Um, Martin Copenhaver wrote a bo- book called Jesus is the Question and uh, he counted them up. And I didn't do the math myself, so I, I'm, I'm taking his word at it and saying maybe his numbers aren't exactly right. But if they're, they're in the ballpark, right? And, and the point is, right, Jesus asked 307 questions in, that are recorded in the Bible. He was also asked a lot of questions by Martin Copenhaver's uh, numbers that he counted 183 questions that Jesus was asked. So he asked a lot of questions. He was asked a lot of questions. But getting a straight answer from Jesus was like the blue-footed booby, right? They exist. There are places where Jesus answered the questions, but they're actually very rare. More often what you see when Jesus was asked a question was he would respond to the question with a question. Or he would respond to the question with a story that didn't necessarily answer the question. It wasn't a straight answer. For example, you know, Jesus, uh, one guy comes to him and, and asks him what the greatest uh, commandment is. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? The guy saying, you know, this is the guy next door. Is, is my family? Is, who's my neighbor? Jesus tells this story about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan story, if you look at it, does not answer the question, who is my neighbor? The, the Good Samaritan story answers the question, who is a neighbor? Who is a neighbor? Who was the neighbor? Right? He was always answering questions with questions, with indirect answers, or on some occasions even like saying, no, I'm not going to answer that question. He asked a question. They said, we're not going to answer. He said, well, I'm not going to answer your question either. Jesus' teaching was so unorthodox in so many, in, in so many ways um, and in other aspects of his teaching. This is, you hear this commonly. The crowds were amazed at what he taught because it says he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. That one of the distinctive qualities of Jesus' teaching was he taught as one who had authority, whereas all the other teachers of their day would say, this is the way, this is the truth, this is what you ought to do. Jesus came to him and said, no, he says, I am the way. I'm not telling you the truth, I am the truth. I'm not showing you the way to life, I am the life. He taught as one that he was the center point of everything that he taught. And in his teaching that was so complex and so hard to understand and so hard to do, Jesus put a a strong emphasis on doing it. It's like he actually told his disciples this hard stuff and he expected them to do it. At the end, again, of Matthew um, 5 through 7, the, the Sermon on the Mount, his, uh, one of his most famous teachings, he's come to this whole thing about um, murder and adultery and his reinterpretation of the law and, and oaths and turning the other cheek and, and um, he talked about um, money and, and faith and trust and all this really hard stuff. And he comes to the end of the whole thing. 
And he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The storms will come, but the house will stand. But if you listen to my words, he says, and you don't put them into practice, you are like a fool building your house on the sand. He expected that his disciples would do the things that he taught them to do. And the other defining quality to Jesus' teaching was that he gave his disciples, he gave his followers endless retakes. Because he taught them these things and he expected them to do them, but over and over and over again, he failed to do them. One of their favorite addresses to Jesus was teacher, but one of the things he often called his disciples was um, little faiths. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you feel like you're failing more than you're succeeding, Jesus would say to you, little faith. But what he didn't do was he didn't kick them out of class. He didn't say, oh, you know what? That was strike three. You're out of here. Over and over and over again, he stays with them. He refuses to let his followers go. He holds on to them. He keeps them in class, steadfast in his devotion, in his commitment to him. Well, not coincidentally, Jesus is teacher. What are his followers? His followers are commonly referred to as, and I've used the word right repeatedly, as disciples. Disciples. I, I, in this context, I actually think it's a little bit unfortunate that when you read the Bible, you see disciple, 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 disciple Jesus over and over and over again. Because I think when we think of disciples, we think of Jesus' followers. And the term in Jesus' day was actually far more generic than that. A disciple, the, the word is um, mathetes, is, was a learner. Whoever they were learning from, they could be a disciple of, of, you know, other, there were disciples of other people. They were learners. They were pupils. To be a disciple was to be a student. How much different would the Bible read if we read, every time we saw disciple, we didn't read disciple, we read student. There are lots of names for Jesus. Because he filled lots of different roles. Because he was doing lots of different things. And we understand that, right? That, that I have lots of different names. I, Deb calls me, um, I think, Deer or, or Hun, or there was something she said under her breath this morning. Um, I, I'm not sure what it was, but, but I've heard it before. It sounded very similar to that. My, my kids called me Dad. Uh, although it's actually a two-syllable word. It's dad. Um, I, a lot of people call me uh, Tim because um, that's the name that my parents gave me when I was born. Um, when I do ride-alongs with the sheriff's department, they always call me sir. Uh, even if I tell them my name, my name they always call me sir. Um, some people call me Mr. Vanderbon. Um, they're always trying to sell me something. Um, some people call me pastor. Uh, they almost always get corrected um, with, just call me Tim. Um, some people call me boss, and then my favorite of all is uh, supreme commander. Uh, only a couple people call me that. And, um, but anyway, right? So I have different people call me different things. Because I have different, the same thing with Jesus. They call him different things because of all these different roles. He's a savior. Well, who calls Jesus savior? Those who have been saved by him, right? Those who have been rescued by him. He's called master. By whom? By those who served him. And, and then as you go on through this story, Jesus comes to this remarkable point with his disciples, and he says, I no longer call you servants. He says, I now call you friends. Because a servant is just serving. Friends know their friends' business and are part partners in it. I call you. I call you friends. Jesus is called comforter. 
helper. All these different names because he did different things and because he does different things. In the Great Commission, this is Jesus' last encounter with his disciples before he ascended into heaven. He, he says to his students, he says, now I want you, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Right? I have the authority. I'm the teacher. You're the student. Therefore, go, my students, he says, go and make students all over the world, teaching them to obey, to obey everything that I commanded you. My students, I'm your teacher. I taught you to do these things. Now I want you to go out in my name, and I want you to teach other people the things that I've been teaching you. I want you to make students all over the world and throughout all of history. And so, Jesus is initiating this new kingdom. And, and the new kingdom has a different set of rules and a different set of values and a different set of goals. And all of that, right, if you're living in a different kingdom under a different king and all of the values are different and all the practices are different and, and all of the, the convictions and all of that is different, what do you need? You, you need a new set of knowledge for that kingdom and a new set of practices to live in that kingdom. And so here's the million-dollar question for each of you today. This is a personal question. How is teacher-student as a descriptor of your relationship with Jesus? If you're like me, I find myself asking Jesus to help me do something, which often really actually translates into, Jesus, would you please do something for me? Right? Would you help me in my old days, help me with my test that's coming up, which really meant, Jesus, would you rescue me from my lack of preparation for this test that I'm about to take? Or Jesus, tell me what to, just tell me, I don't, whatever, just tell me what to do. Direct me. How did Jesus interact with it? He didn't just tell them what to do. He taught them a set of beliefs, convictions, knowledge, a new way of seeing things, a new way of understanding things. He taught them the truth. And then he equipped them with skills to do those things and trained them with practices to help them get better at it. So little faith could become people of great faith. We're starting a series today. I'm calling it Uncommon Core. And the, the question and the invitation into the series is, is this. Would you say with me, Jesus, you're my friend. Thank you for that. Jesus, you're my Savior. Thank you for that. Would you say with me, teacher? Teacher. Jesus, teach me. Teach me how to navigate my way through the world that we're living in. Teach me how to, to love my neighbor in the midst of, of a divided world. Teach me how to manage my finances in the, in the midst of all the, the turmoil. Teach me how to be a good neighbor. Teach, would you say with me, Jesus, teach me. Be, and we're going to look at, throughout this at all the ways and all the things that Jesus taught his disciples and learned from. Would you say with me, Jesus, teach me. Equip me. Give me the practices that I need to get better at it. Jesus, teach us. Teach us how to prioritize our lives. 
teach us how to pray. Teach us how to wait, how to forgive, how to serve, how to worship. Jesus, teach us. Uncommon core. How are you doing in a relationship with Jesus that is teacher-student? It's the call of discipleship. Lord, I pray that as we begin um, this journey of reminding, reminding myself and reminding us again that while you are our Lord and our Savior, and that is good news, um, that you are also our teacher. And, and that as our teacher in the world that we live in, that you have claimed as your own and are restoring as your kingdom, that we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. And so we raise up our hand and we say, Jesus, would you teach me how to find my way as your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your servant, your student in this world, preparing me and us for your coming kingdom. We pray in your name. Amen.